Hey everybody, how are you guys doing this week? It's great to see you all back for session 12 now of Foundational Faith. And we are still in the uh, session or the section of this series talking about who is God, who God is. And we're talking about different characteristics and different elements of his character and his person. Last week we talked, uh, uh, mentioned how God is love and God is just. We have two more uh, characteristics that we are going to look at today. Uh, God is good and God is truthful. And uh, as always, we're going to be uh, hitting some Bible verses before each one of those and then uh, expanding on them and, and talking about some of the elements that we can pull out from those scriptures. Uh, before we get into any of that, though, we are going to open up in a word of prayer as we always do. So let's go ahead and bow our heads and just invite God to be the one to teach us today and reveal truth. Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done, Lord. We thank you for your word and we thank you for your spirit, Father. Lord, I pray now in Jesus' name that as we go into your word, as we read about these characteristics of who you are, Father, that it not be my voice or my logic that comes forth, but Lord, it truly be the revelation of your Holy Spirit that teaches us. Lord, we thank you that you have given us not only your word, but you've given us your spirit to teach us and reveal all truth to us. We give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So as I said, our, our two uh, areas that we are going to look at today are uh, that God is good and that God is also truthful. And we're going to start out with God's goodness, that he is good. We're going to look at three verses. Matthew chapter 19 verse 17 tells us this. Why do you ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Romans 8, 28 says this, And if we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Amen. And finally, Psalms chapter 107, verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. You know, one of the things that the world wants us to believe is that people are essentially good at heart. But they just make mistakes and uh, get blinded by their desires and treat people in a negative way that maybe they don't really want to. But you see, the reality is this. People are not good at heart. Yes, we were each created by God and created in his own image, yet he gave us something that he did not give to any other creature. He gave us a choice. We failed. Let's just lay it out there. We failed at making that choice. And as a result, we disobeyed him. And the heart of man was tainted for all generations to come. You know, it doesn't matter how clean a glass of water is. If only one drop of contamination is allowed in the water it's no longer going to be clean. Bacteria is gonna grow and grow and grow until the once clean uh, glass of water is nothing but uh, filth. And we can see the full extent of exactly this happening. Only five chapters after God had created man in the book of Genesis. Let me see, I believe I have this up there too. Genesis chapter five, or I'm sorry, chapter six, verse five tells us this. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth 
and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. This is the result of a world in which we have chosen to ignore God and his laws. No one, not a single human being, is good because we have each sinned. If the world we live in was left only to human hands and to be ruled by human wisdom, then I'm going to tell you something very directly. That world would literally be a hell on earth. The statement we see about the condition of the world here in Genesis 6 would be completely true for our world today. People will say often, how can there be a God who loves us if there are so many bad things in the world today? And he lets so many evil things happen. But I'm going to tell you, this is the incorrect perspective. And it's really the wrong question to ask. If we view our condition from the correct perspective, then the right question that we should be asking ourselves is this. Why is it that given the fallen state of creation, the sinful heart of man, and the evil plans of the adversary, is there any good in the world at all? Do you see the change in the perspective that is apparent here? If it were not for God and his presence in this world, there would be no good at all. Any good that is present is not a result of human beings, but it is a result of the presence and the work of the Lord on earth. He is the only source of goodness, and apart from him, nothing and no one is good. Another question we should maybe consider on this topic is this. What does it actually mean to be good? Have you ever thought about that? What does that actually mean? If I say that person's a good person, what does that mean? We use the word good to describe many things in so many different situations and experiences. But what does it mean when we say that God is good? The word good may become clearer when we add its opposite into the conversation, evil. In almost every book we read, every movie we watch, or story that we hear, there is virtually, uh, without exception, some element of good versus evil. And most of the time, the right way, the good way, uh, tends to win in the stories that we see. Evil is the opposite of good, just as we know that Satan is the opposite or the adversary of God. The things that God does and, what, uh, and the way that he behaves, we will find are the opposite of the things that Satan does and the way that he behaves. When we think of it in this light, we can start to see that God is not good because he matches our definition of what good means. Rather, now think, try to just wrap your mind about this. Goodness is defined by God and his very character and nature. If something is opposed to who God is, then it is by definition not good. It's evil. There's no in-between ground. There's no gray area there. If we want to understand what is good, then we must simply look to who God is and not to anything else. And you know, I want to add one more thing into this here. Uh, there is often a, uh, a saying that, uh, and this relates to the Genesis 6-5 verse there. There are other translations of that verse that say uh, that he saw that every inclination of their heart was nothing but evil all the time. 
Now, there is this uh, saying that we often hear in our culture and our world today that says you should follow your heart. Whatever your heart tells you you should do, then that, that's what you should be doing. You should listen to your heart and go with that. But I want to tell you that unless your heart is governed by Jesus Christ, unless the Spirit of God is alive and active, then you are simply going to be following evil. Because the heart of man is set on nothing but evil all the time. So we need to examine our hearts and determine what are we actually following? Jesus or the evil that we are so naturally inclined to? It's an interesting way to think when we consider that truth. And truth is our next characteristic. God is truthful. We're going to go ahead and get into a few more scriptures here. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 8, 8 verse 18 tells us this. So God has given both his promise and his oath that two things are unchangeable. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. John 17, 17 says this, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And then Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, it tells us this, God is not human that he should lie, not a human being, that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and then not fulfill? You know, <laughs> truthfulness is a quality that is becoming less and less common in our world. When we listen to conversations around us or look at advertisements or hear the messages that we hear spoken by people in the media, you're going to start to see that it can be very hard to know what is actually true. It seems that everyone has an opinion about everything, and they're quick to demonstrate why their opinion is in fact true. Sometimes they can make a very convincing argument of it as well. So then, the question comes, how are we to know the truth? How are we to discern if something that's being spoken is in fact the truth? Well, I want to first talk about what makes something true. The definition that we as humans have established for truth is this. The quality or state of being true, that which is true or in accordance with fact or reality. Our understanding of this is that truth is what actually is. So let, let me repeat that. Our understanding of this, of truth, is that truth is what actually is. Truth is not an opinion or speculation, and it cannot be changed. If something is true, and then it is changed, then it was never true. God is truth, and this first means that what he does and what he says is true. Once God speaks or acts, those things become the truth and the reality of them cannot be changed. No matter what somebody may say, no matter what they may do, God has said and done nothing and it can God has said and done nothing that can ever be changed. When God has said it and done it, that is it. It is truth. Because of this, we can also be certain that when God speaks something, he is not going to say something that will later become 
untrue. In other words, God is not going to lie to us or trick us or tell us one thing today and then change it tomorrow. There are, oh, there, there's no one else in this world and no other source that we can be assured of will never lie to us. This should bring us complete peace and confidence. We should have total peace and confidence to know that what God tells us is completely honest and true. This also means that we do not need to doubt anything that he has told us. If he has spoken it, he is bound to it. Not because if uh, he doesn't fulfill his word, then it would mean he has not done something that is contrary to his very nature, but because he is who he says he is, and he will do what he says he will do. It's a peaceful thought to think you never have to wonder if God is telling you the truth. You see, because God's words and actions are true and because he is the author of all that happens, we can also say that God is the source of all truth. If it doesn't come from God, it is not coming from the source of truth. Similar to what we've learned about goodness, if God were not present in our world today, then there would really be nothing that we could find a truth in. One of the names that has been used in reference to Satan is the deceiver. Now, a deceiver is someone who attempts to lead a person to believe something that is not true. We can see the work of the deceiver in our world today in that so many have rejected the truth of Christ. However, no matter how much the deceiver may work to trick mankind, the fact and the reality will never change. God is truth, and his desire is to share in a relationship with you so that you are no longer deceived, but instead know the truth. His desire is that you know him and his truth. So we're going to continue on here. We, we've talked about these different characteristics. We've talked about who God is. We've talked about all these different things. There's one last fundamental question that we're going to wrestle with when we're talking about who God is. After all this information, we've talked about the Bible. We've talked about what the Bible is. We've talked about who God is. Why do I need God? That's a, that's a question that I think many people, especially those who don't know him yet, may pose to those who do tell them about him. Why do I need him? Let's take a look at the way that his word answers this question. Isaiah 53, 6 says, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord has laid on him, referring to Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. Romans 3, 22 through 24, it says, This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Acts chapter 4 verses 12 says, This is, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. That question that we just asked, why do I need God? That has been asked by many people. Many people who have had difficult lives and who have experienced suffering feel that if there is a God, then why did he allow them to suffer? Because of this, they want to push God away and have nothing to do with him. Others who have not experienced difficulty in their lives view their lives as possibly good and complete. 
they often might say that they're healthy, they're happy, they don't understand why they need to make any changes. So then how can we respond to these questions? How can we show people who do not have a relationship with God and maybe not even desire to, that they actually desperately need one? I think the first thing we need to do is define what we're talking about when we say relationship. A relationship is defined as the way in which two or more people regard and behave toward each other, the interaction between two people. Each person being who has ever been created has a relationship with God. Satan himself, believe it or not, has a relationship with God. And all the demons all believe in God. You would never convince Satan that God is not real. He surely knows God is very real. So it's not simply enough to acknowledge that God exists or to say that you believe in him. We can also see from the scriptures that we just read that all of us, every one of us, has sinned and fallen short of the mark. No matter how good we believe we are or how good someone appears to be, our actions will never be enough. Our works will never get us what we need. The reality is each one of us was created to be in relationship with God, the Lord, our Father, and to bring glory to his name. This is the fundamental purpose of our relationship, our existence. So if we're not engaging in the fundamental purpose of our existence, how can we truly experience joy and commitment, contentment, joy and contentment? The Bible tells us that the joy of sin lasts only for a while, but at some point, no matter if it's hours, days, months, or maybe even years, the fun of that sin is eventually going to fade and we're going to be left with emptiness. When this happens, we're going to begin to desperately search for the next thing. The next thing that we believe can bring that happiness, that contentment back into our lives. You know, you can see this behavior when you look at an addict. Uh, possibly a drug addict or some other type of addict. If you watch the cycle of addiction, you're going to see some key things happen every time. When the person first dries a, a, the drug, they feel great. They feel like they have all that they need. They're lifted so, uh, so far above their normal feeling. The drug wears off and they come back down or crash is what they call is what they refer to it, and the reality of the world comes back to them. <clears throat> they immediately decide they need more, and when they get it, they find that the more they use it, the less the original effect of the drug uh, has on them. That original high that they experienced uh, becomes less and less. But every time they crash, every time they come down, it gets harder and deeper until actually they're taking to drug uh, just to try to make themselves feel like they can make it through the day. Forget the joy or the happiness that they may have experienced the first time they tried. It's now just a way to cope with life. This is what life without Christ looks like. Everything we find in this world will end. I want to repeat that again. Every single thing you find in this world will end. And every single thing you find will lead you to emptiness. There's only one thing that can bring us eternal joy and contentment. The, the, the joy and contentment that we desperately seek. 
And that is we, that's when we come back to fulfill the true purpose for which we have been created. That is to be, relate, to be in a relationship with God our Father through Christ Jesus and to bring him glory. That is what brings our life fulfillment. So what then does it mean to be in relationship with him? It is not simply believing that he is real or trying not to do bad things. But being in a relationship means you believe in him. You believe you are a sinner who has no hope of salvation and happiness on your own. You believe that in order to forgive your sins, God sent his son Jesus as a sacrifice to pay the penalty for your sins, and you accept Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. It means that you begin to read his word and you spend time in communion through with him through prayer. And finally, it means that you begin to obey what it is he has told you to do. When you begin to engage in a real relationship, the kind of relationship we're talking about right now with the Lord, your life will begin to be changed forever and ever, and you will experience joy and contentment like you have never experienced, nor could nor could ever experience with any other thing that you will find in the world anywhere. And what's greatest of all, unlike the things of this world, those, uh, those things, those contentments, that joy will be with you for all eternity. It will never decrease. It will never go away because he will be with you always in relationship. This is why we so desperately need him, because without him, we are going to be lost. We are going to always be searching for what it is we've been created for. So as we come to a close in this message, I'd like to just pray for you uh, and uh, lift you up. So let's go ahead and do that. Father, we thank you for this time. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your truthfulness. And Father, we thank you that you desire to have relationship with us. Even when we reject you, Father, you still desire us and pursue us. And Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name, Lord, that if there be one listening today, one watching that does not know you, Lord, that they are touched by your Holy Spirit at this time. Father, that they surrender to you and that they seek to obey what you have called them to do. Father, continue to draw us closer to you, reveal truth to us, and lead us and guide us as we pursue more of you in our lives. We thank you, we praise you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, again, I want to thank you guys for joining me again this week for session 12, and I look forward to seeing you next week as we dive into another uh, session in the Foundational Faith series. Have a great week, everybody, and God bless. Bye.